These little guys hang out in eucalyptus trees and sleep 19 hours a day. They don't have to work much because they're surrounded by their only food, eucalyptus leaves. They eat so many of them that they smell like eucalyptus cough drops. And they're such adorable animals, they become the wildlife ambassadors for Australia, the only place they're found in the wild. I'm Jack Hanna, and these are Queensland koalas. Join us on Zoo Life to learn more about the animals of the world. One of the best things about zoos and nature parks is that they let you get close to the animals, seeing them as you never could in the wild. Here at the Australian Wildlife Park in Sydney, they take that concept to an extreme, encouraging you to get as close to the animals of Australia as possible. So close that even if you're not a zoo director like me, you can cuddle a koala or have your picture taken with one. Most of these animals are hand raised, so they don't seem to mind the attention. In fact, they thrive on it. The Australian Wildlife Park has been tremendously successful in breeding Queensland koalas. Ever hear a koala in the mood for love? It's not an uncommon sound around here. 11 koalas were born here last year alone. Our goal is to breed excess animals for our own needs, which we will then radio collar and release into areas where koalas once were, and to track them through the bush to make sure that they have adapted to their new life. And once we feel that they can be unleashed from mankind, we take off their little computerized collar and off they go. Now, I know they're a marsupial, which means the young are raised in the pouch. Mm -hmm. Just where is the pouch? That's a good question. Now, her pouch, yep. <laughs> she's got a good grip of you there. Just turn around, I'll take this branch. Okay, she's got your claws in her neck. Okay. That's it there. The pouch is sitting right there. Right there's the pouch. Huh. And because she's immature, it's not very well developed. Now, the males have a very interesting thing. He has a scent gland, that's that dark patch in the middle of his chest there. And that scent gland is used to rub on the branches of the trees to mark out his territory. Their nose is so cute, it almost looks like a fake rubber nose. Yeah, it is. It's very sensitive to smell. He'll always smell the leaf before he eats it. Another very interesting thing, for climbing, they've adapted. They've got two thumbs. You can see him holding my thumb, three fingers on this side, two thumbs on that side. Their fur is so soft, is it true they hunted the koala for its coat? Unfortunately, yes. Earlier this century, there were literally millions of these animals hunted for their skins. Today, they're totally protected, and you could end up in jail or paying a very heavy fine if you harmed a koala in any way. Well, I tell you, Terry, these animals are as cute as everybody says they are. They sure are. They are precious. The park offers a broad sampling of animals that are uniquely Australian. From creatures the continent is famous for, like kangaroos and dingoes, to lesser known but equally interesting animals, like the ant-eating echidna, the ostrich-like emu, and the common wombat, Australia's version of a prairie dog. He does look like me, doesn't he? He's so nice. Common wombats are exceedingly alert to any new scent, which they'll tend to follow with great determination. And they can run at up to 20 miles per hour, which is a lot faster Whoops. than anyone in our crew. Whoa, easy guy. Whoa. <laughs> Fortunately, wombats are not good at jumping. <laughs> the Australian Wildlife Park has 15 flying foxes on display, also called fruit bats. Flying foxes are quite common in Sydney. They are a very interesting group of animals. For many years, we thought they were closely related to primates, but recently this has been disproven. We're not quite sure where they actually come from. Known also as fruit bats, 
These sociable creatures come from tropical and semi-tropical areas and live in colonies that sometimes number a million or more. Tell me about their diet. What are we feeding them? We're feeding them here a mixture of fruits, so it's like a big fruit salad. Uh, things like papayas and cantaloupes, and even stone fruit. It looks like they've got little hands or claws on their wings. They sure do. It's just like our hand, but it's elongated and there's a lot of webbing in there. See the thumb here? That's like a thumb and they use that to grab onto each other. I've heard that some people eat these. They do, yeah. Un unfortunately, in certain parts of the world, particularly in the South Pacific, these animals are considered a delicacy. Terry, just what is their role in the wild? Believe it or not, these animals are responsible for the seeding of the rainforests. The health of the rainforest relies on flying foxes. They eat the fruit, they don't digest the seed. So they defecate and the seed then grows into more trees. So the health of a rainforest relies on these guys. The Australian Wildlife Park also displays a sampling of the scalier side of the continent's wildlife. Guanas are the down-under equivalent of monitor lizards. They're found in the more arid parts of the outback, where they prey on reptiles and small mammals. The frill-necked lizard, also known as the frilled dragon, comes from tropical northern Australia. But the most impressive reptile here is a prime example of the largest reptile species on Earth, the saltwater crocodile. At 16 feet and 1,700 pounds, maniac, as they call him, is slightly overweight even for a growing young crocodile. So keepers here exercise him. We do that with a long pole and we call it our maniac aquarobics. We splash with the pole on the uh, water surface. He feels that through pressure gauges along his jaw and comes up looking for something to grab at. And by provoking him to strike several times and to turn in the water, which is something he wouldn't normally do without a reason, we're actually burning off a lot of that fat. Saltwater crocodiles become so rare in the wild that the Australian government forbids killing or harming them. But the crocodile in this exhibit seems to protect itself just fine. What are you doing there now? Well, I'm going to throw this chicken to him and we're going to see if he'll uh, All right, let's react try as he would to a large animal. Good one this time. He should feel the resistance of the pretty, rope. Is that pretty strong? Yeah, very yeah. strong. Can we pull him out of the water? Uh, no, nah, I wouldn't advise getting him too close. <laughs> now, this, 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 I'm so nervous I can't talk. Could he eat somebody as big as you or me? Oh, yes, yeah. He'd shake our arms and legs off, but he'd eat the main part of our torso and head. <laughs> is the crocodile, does it kill people in Australia? Oh, yes, yeah. We've had 13 known deaths in the last few years. And of course, in uh, Arnhem Land, where the Aboriginals live, we have no record of how many get eaten. There could be a lot more. Well, yes. oh, he is powerful. Incredible oh, oh, oh. oh, You're right, Jack. Huh? Don't sit down on the job, we're not finished. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Now, if he was to out, could he outrun us up here? He could throw his length out of the water if his head was back where it was before, quicker than you and I could probably react and move away. But he couldn't outrun us over a distance. Is that the size of crocodile, crocodile Dundee? Uh, yeah, that'll be about the same size. Most of the ones that kill people are around five metres. Well, good day, mate. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Australia is an island continent with more than 20,000 miles of coastline. Almost all of the country's population lives along these coasts. So it's easy to understand why the people here are so fascinated with sea life. When the people in Sydney want to get a closer look at life underwater, they come right here to the Manly Oceanarium. Let's go take a look. Most of the Oceanarium is devoted to a gigantic donut-shaped display that swarms with sea life. Built around a circular acrylic tunnel more than 100 yards in circumference, the exhibit is designed for the benefit of both fish and fish fans. The general idea is to immerse humans in the world of offshore Australia, and boy is it teeming with life. There's practically an entire food chain at your fingertips here, from major predators to tiny reef fish. Visitors often wonder why the bigger fish don't eat the smaller ones. The truth of the matter is that sometimes they do. But aquarists here are able to keep predation to a minimum by feeding the larger fish frequently. And to make sure that everyone gets a fair share, they do it by hand. We don't feed the same type of fish all of the time, simply because they don't eat the same type of fish all the time in the wild. It would be like if someone gave us pizzas every day of a week, uh, we'd soon get sick of pizzas. Some of the larger rays are even fussier than the sharks. They'll take handouts, but like the rest of us, they'd rather have their fish fresh. 
they actually go and smother their prey. I'll swim over top of it and parachute down on top of it so that the fish is stuck underneath their, underneath their body mass. And then they'll just wiggle around on their body mass until eventually the fish gets up around their mouth and they'll, they'll bite it. They have very powerful crushing jaws. They don't have sharp teeth like sharks. And they'll just crush it to pieces and eat it. With all this feeding going on, I wondered what was keeping the divers from being eaten. We're always led to believe that sharks are these really hungry animals roaming around the oceans just looking for food all of the time. That's not necessarily true. Uh, when they need food, they'll, they'll take it. But they're so uh, perfectly designed for their environment, they require very little energy to drive them through the water. These are grey nurse sharks. Ian Gordon has been studying the species for the past 10 years, both in the oceanarium and off the coast where their populations have been decimated by shark hunters. They live in an area where it's fairly shallow so divers can access it very easily. And they hover above the bottom uh, in what we call gutters, which are like gullies uh, in the ocean where the current races through. So it's very easy for a diver to just swim straight up and hit them in the head with a power stick or a bang stick and, uh, and the shark's dead. The Australian government outlawed the killing of grey nurse sharks in 1984. Ian hopes the ban will enable wild populations to recover. There is so little we know about sharks that it's very important that people like myself and, and uh, other, other scientists around the world work very hard on trying to learn as much as we can about these animals. If we don't, we could lose the animals before we really find out how important they actually are in the food chain. and uh, so she's a bit sleep now, she's a bit like Valium. So she's a little bit, a little bit groggy right at this very moment. Now what are you getting ready to do with her? Well, we're gonna weigh her right now. Why do you bring him in here? Okay, we have to check them out about every year. Uh, just so we can see what sort of growth rates uh, they're getting. And this is a nurse shark? This is a grey nurse shark, yeah, it's a female. Uh, okay, you ready? Lift. <laughs> Okay. I know one thing, she's heavy. Yep, got that picture three. Now, do you, do you check its teeth? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the teeth while we're at it, yeah, once we've got it caught. <laughs> Just want to watch the teeth because that's a bitey bit. <laughs> the business end. The business end. Funnily enough, you're the one closest to the business end. <laughs> we're going to measure up. Okay. okay, just tie a knot. Boy, look at that. Ian, yeah, those teeth. Yeah, it's a good set of wow. teeth, eh? Hey? Uh, these guys drop teeth on a very regular basis, so we don't really have to worry about holes in their teeth, but uh, we still have a quick look anyway, just to make sure. Well, this is the closest I've ever been to a shark's mouth. <laughs> yeah, the closest you want to become too, I'd say. Now, why do you keep her on her back? Well, when we keep them on their back, it tends to disorient them. And uh, while we're disoriented, it just helps to uh, calm them down a bit. As soon as I roll her over, she's going to start kicking almost immediately. All right, I'll let you go ahead and roll her okay. over there. Now, Paul, can you keep a hold of that tail? Yes. Okay, drop the net away. If given the choice, often I'd, I'd spend time with sharks and humans. <laughs> So I think to a degree, uh, sharks are nicer than what we think. But I must stress that they are potentially dangerous animals as well. And they're not like teddy bears. beneath the foothills of the Great Dividing Range, 
the Hillsville Sanctuary was started 70 years ago on a piece of virgin bushland. More than 78 acres of the park are devoted to exhibits. Another 200 acres remain undeveloped, preserved as habitat for local wildlife. We make people try and see animals in a, a natural bushland habitat and just make them appreciate that if we don't do something to preserve those species, then we're going to lose some very, very important animals indeed. The eyesight of the uh, wedge-tailed eagle is pretty phenomenal. They have been documented at hunting uh, brown rabbit. The sanctuary takes in and rehabilitates hundreds of injured animals every year. Those that can't be returned to the wild participate in educational programs. Here you'll see healthy examples of all kinds of Australian wildlife. From predators like the dingo and the lace monitor, to local birds like the sacred ibis, the broga crane, and the kookaburra. The park is also a wildlife research center. The first and only platypus birth in captivity took place here in 1943. The sanctuary has also bred lesser known and rarer animals like the eastern barred bandicoot and the yellow-bellied glider. The short beak echidna is this continent's version of the anteater. They live on small insects like termites and ants and are found throughout Australia. The echidna is a monotreme an ancient life form that shares traits of both reptiles and mammals. For example, the echidna lays eggs, but once the eggs hatch, it nourishes its young with milk. Like a lizard, the echidna's limbs are attached to the sides of its body rather than beneath it. This leg structure allows the animal to disappear into the ground within seconds. Now, I notice it's got a long nose there. Now, is that, does that bite or? No, inside the long nose is a very long sticky tongue. So that goes right into the ant hill or the termite mound. The ants, the termites stick to it, and then it brings it back into its mouth. It's got such big feet. What, what do they use them for? They use these feet for uh, digging into termite mounds, but also they use them to escape predators. Would you like to see it happening? Yeah, let's go. OK, let's go. So you can see, once it goes down into the ground, it just digs in immediately, just scraping the soil around it. And if you feel right down at ground level, this, the, the quills are right on the ground. So any animals trying to get under it have a very hard job. Boy, Simon, you're right. You can't even pick this thing up. What a great means of defense. Yeah, it's completely protected now that it's digging underground. The world's only other monotreme is a furry cousin of the echidna. The duck-billed platypus has got to be one of the strangest animals I've ever met. They're common in the streams of eastern Australia, but because they are shy and mostly nocturnal, very little is known about them. Researchers here are working to fill that information gap by gathering basic biological data on them. Hillsville Sanctuary is the best place to study platypus in the whole world. And the reason is, is that we have a, a very healthy wild population living in the stream on the sanctuary. We also have a population that's living in captivity that can be studied at the same time. Dr. Melody Serena of Chicago's Brookfield Zoo has been trapping and radio tagging platypus here for almost two years. The platypus is fit with a little miniature radio transmitter and this is just a radio receiver but it's a special one because it's for wildlife. It's, it's especially sensitive. And this, is, this aerial picks up the strongest signal when it's pointing straight at the platypus. Oh, here it is. This is what I've been looking for. This is the burrow of the platypus that we've been, that we've been looking for. And you can see that she's been going up the bank, up and down on this side where the moss is worn away. She's been going down on, up and down on this side as well, on the other side of the tree fern. The whole point of the platypus program at the sanctuary is to help conserve the animals in the wild and also to provide optimal conditions for them in captivity. Both the feeding tanks and the display tank have natural materials in it like logs and rocks and so forth. There's uh, live freshwater crayfish that hide down among the rocks and the platypus can forage for that live food in the display tank. Because its eyes and ears close completely when it goes underwater to feed, the platypus has evolved its own special method for detecting food. Its soft leathery bill is lined with receptors which pick up minute electrical currents produced by crayfish, worms, and other food sources. Boy, Melody, this, this looks like something like a, a rabbit with a duck's beak on it. <laughs> they are very unusual animals. And, and why, is, why is he, Simon, holding this by the tail? 
Uh, in the in the male platypuses, there's a spur right here. You can see it. Yeah. Well, this animal is actually just one year old, but in the two year old male, they they produce a kind of a poison, which they can use by um, to actually envenom people. And so, if you hold it by the tail, you can stay out of the way. I see. And, and I noticed his fur seems so soft. A platypus has fur just like an otter's fur. It's very thick and dense because the animal's aquatic, and so it's important that the animal stay well insulated and dry in the water. Now his feet look just like a duck's foot. Is that what makes him go so fast in the water? Well, the, the feet are interesting, especially the front feet, because they have two different purposes. They have wide, special paddles for swimming. You can see how they open up wide in order to allow the animal to swim very quickly in the water, but they also have uh, strong claws so the animal can burrow. Well, this is really something I've never dreamed I'd ever get to see a real platypus. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm, it's my pleasure. They're absolutely fantastic animals. The Melbourne Zoo was established in 1857, making it the oldest zoo in Australia and one of the oldest zoos in the world. But its exhibits couldn't be more up to date. Just take a look at this Australian bushland exhibit. This could be called an interactive exhibit. Nothing separates the visitors from the animals and you're welcome to meet them up close. At this range, it's easy to see why roos, as kangaroos are known down here, belong to the family of macropods, which means big feet. Flightless emus are Australia's version of the ostrich and are still common on the plains of northwestern Australia. On the other hand, kangaroos can be found all over the continent. There are dozens of different kinds of kangaroos. They may vary in size and color, but their shape and their way of getting around are pretty much familiar to all of us. Some kangaroos, however, due to a quirk of evolution, live in trees, and they have more in common with monkeys than they do with other kangaroos. Kangaroos that live in trees? Well, all roos once lived in the trees that long ago covered a great deal of Australia. But when the climate changed and dried out, most of them took to life on the ground. For some reason, these Goodfellows tree kangaroos climbed back into the branches where they could browse and forage for leafy food sources. Unfortunately, their forest habitat is quickly disappearing due to modern farm and timber operations. 80% of their natural habitat is, uh, is just about already gone. So therefore, there are species that we have to concentrate in captivity, in breeding them and in genetically keeping a viable population going to either release back into the wild, hopefully, if there is, is area to release them back into, but also to keep that viable genetic material worldwide. I noticed he, he walked down the tree backwards. Why do they do that? <laughs> Yes, for balance actually, because they're so robust in the, um, in the hindquarters here, they actually shimmy down the tree backwards to, to keep their balance so they don't fall. I notice his claws and hands, they aren't adapted for climbing, are they? No, but um, they're quite dexterous though using, using their, their claws uh, for this particular reason, just for, for grasping leaves oh, and grasping. branches. Yeah, so they're, they're very strong and they can pull the branch towards them. Uh, depending on wherever they're situated in the tree. And what about their tail? Yeah, that's used as a balance, as a rudder. So when they jump from tree to tree, it keeps them balanced. So therefore they don't uh, you know, run into <laughs> trees or fall, uh, fall head first onto the ground. You know, it's one thing to see a bird in a tree, but to see kangaroos climbing in trees, I guess that's only in Australia, huh? This is true. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We've got some pretty fascinating um, animal species in this country. It's always a treat to see a beautiful butterfly. Here at Melbourne's Butterfly House, though, visitors can be captivated by some 800 of these delicate, fluttering creatures. 
all at one time. Ernst, this looks like a dinner table for butterflies. Is that what it is? Yes, it is. It's, uh, instead of having to use natural flowers, we made this arrangement um, where we place nectar in these little uh, disc areas. How do they know how to come down to these three tables? Well, they see, of course, when they fly by, they see the colours and um, that attracts them initially. But once they land on these little discs, they have actually their uh, taste buds are under their feet itself. And the moment they get in touch with this uh, artificial nectar solution, they realise that it's food. Now, I notice this little thing looks like an arm keeps sticking in those holes. What is that? That's its uh, proboscis. It's like a straw. It's like a uh, tongue? Long tongue? No, like its mouth, uh -huh. actually, and it uses this to uh, suck up the uh, now, look at that. liquid. Their wings look real delicate, and their thin little legs. How do they survive? Oh, I think they're pretty tough. You can't handle the wings because they, the uh, coloration comes off. But uh, the structure itself, it has pretty strong vines which are hardened and sort of form ribs. And really all a butterfly has to do is live for about four weeks, produce enough time and lay eggs, and um, so it doesn't have a long time to live. Since butterflies have such brief lives, the zoo must continually replenish their population. In the wild, each butterfly lays its eggs on a particular plant. When the caterpillar hatches, the plant provides a ready-made food source. Here in the butterfly house, the insects have their own special nursery. The keepers carefully collect each egg one by one, then take them to a nearby hatching facility. Here they will go through one of the most spectacular changes in nature, metamorphosis. Although the butterfly lays the eggs, a caterpillar is hatched. This climate-controlled greenhouse nurtures members from some 15 Australian species, up to 5,000 at one time. After the eggs hatch, the keepers will give the newborn caterpillars their own plant to feed on, which will take them through several stages of growth. The caterpillars cannot grow like, you know, humans do. They actually have a solid skin around them which can't expand, so as the body grows itself, it sort of has to get rid of the old, old skin so that its body can actually enlarge. And it does that four to five times. Once it's to its final stage as a caterpillar, it will then find a resting place on the plant, attach itself with a bit of silk, and start transforming itself into what's called a pupa. And that's the dormant stage in which the, initially the caterpillar, now it's a pupa, will turn into a butterfly. To ensure its safety, once the caterpillar becomes a pupa, or cocoon, the keepers detach it and place it in a sponge-like cavity. It doesn't take up any food. It just sits there maybe for two or three weeks. But basically, when they're ready, they then burst open, and out comes the butterfly. First, the wings are only tiny little stumps, and as the butterfly comes out and hangs upside down, blood gets pumped into the wings and they unfold and harden maybe in one or two hours and then it can fly. 25,000 of these delicate creatures are introduced to the butterfly house each year. As they flutter their gossamer wings, it's easy to forget that butterflies are really insects and not magical beings who can eternally enchant us. Nothing says Australia like a koala. It's certainly one of the Down Under's best ambassadors to America. Although, sleeping 18 hours a day, it's not exactly a party animal. He had a good girl. The koala lives most of its life in the eucalyptus trees, which is fortunate, considering that the leaves are about all it eats. It's no wonder koalas end up smelling like eucalyptus cough drops. 
At Bush Gardens in Tampa, Florida, both the public and zookeepers have anxiously waited to see the new koala baby. This joey, or baby, is a first for the program at Bush Gardens. Kunara was actually born six months ago to Adele, a 10-year-old Queensland koala. But koalas aren't fully developed when they're born, so Kunara stayed hidden away in his mother's pouch until recently, while he grew into this huggable, furry baby. He'll, he'll start venturing out and, you know, just experimenting, seeing what it's like over in this branch without mom, but he might get a little upset and then run back and hold on to her. Bush Gardens is also home to the Dama Wallaby, the smallest member of the kangaroo family. The Dama Wallaby used to be very abundant, but due to brush fires and habitat destruction and uh, natural predators, they've been reduced. So now they're um, protected by legislation by the government. Many times the wallabies, for reasons we may not even know, do get rejected by the mothers and come out of the pouch. In the wild, of course, this wallaby would not reach adulthood, but thanks to the the success of the Bush Gardens uh, breeding program, we have the facilities here to provide a more or less a natural habitat for the wallaby to grow in. And it also gets numerous amounts of feedings of milk to compensate for the milk it would be getting on a constant basis inside the mo mother's pouch. The joey feeds very easily. They don't suck like a monkey would. They lap it up, so it does feed kind of slow but uh, it's, it's hard to get the nipple into the small mouth. Not taking any more? Let's make that mouth. In the mother's pouch, there's humidity and the natural oils from the mother would keep the, the joey, which has no hair, till about four or five months. It would keep it nice and soft. We have to provide it with a mineral oils, which we rub on maybe twice a day. The joey, we think, is about three months old. And the joey would stay in the isolate for at least up to six months. After it would leave here, it would probably be introduced to another wallaby, so it could start to relate to other wallabies. One of the biggest Australian exhibits outside of Australia is the Fort Wayne's Children's Zoo in Indiana. Jack and his friend Brooke Bresnan explore the outback from a new perspective. There's nothing like meeting a roo face to face. This remarkable animal can hop as much as 27 feet and run 40 miles per hour. It uses its heavy tail like a rudder when it's running, and when resting, as a handy support. In the kangaroo walkabout, no barriers separate visitors from the friendly residents. That's something. Do you hop like a kangaroo? Huh? Here, sit up. I'll stretch your belly. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. She loves her neck itch. Most of the time, the mother roos rear their own joeys. Even after they leave the pouch, the youngsters come back for meal times. But once in a while, the keepers have to help out a little. Elaine, did you did you hand raise this kangaroo? Yes, I did. Wasn't it difficult to raise a baby kangaroo? It took a lot of time. And what was wrong with her? She had a broken leg, and she had an external pin on her leg, and her mom wouldn't take her back in the pouch. Is her leg all right? It's just fine. She hops just as well as the rest of the kangaroos. Now, now how old are they when they come out of the pouch? This type of kangaroo, they're usually about uh, six months old when you first see their head out of the pouch, and they stay in and out of the pouch until they're about 11 months old. Gee, so how old is she now? She's about two years old now. Obviously, you don't have a pouch. How'd you raise her? I carried her in a fake pouch around my neck and took her every place I went. A fake pouch around your neck? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do people think about that? 
Well, my mother got very embarrassed when we went to the grocery store in the frozen food section. She got kind of active. <laughs> hey, don't you have a baby, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, me. She learned to play with my dogs. So now uh, you're introducing her to other kangaroos? Right, she's gonna meet the other kangaroos and hopefully learn to be happy down here in the yard with the rest of our roos. Boy, she looks happy. You wouldn't even know she broke her leg. Well, thanks for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed meeting these creatures from down under as much as I have. Please keep in mind that no matter where we live, the city, suburbs, or the country. We're sharing the world with wild animals that deserve our attention and respect. Be sure to join us next time on Zoo Life when I'll introduce you to some more of our Earth's magnificent creatures. Anheuser-Busch Theme Park's Conservation Moment. The Pledge Made Real. Koalas may not be in immediate danger, but like so many animals on the planet, their future is in doubt. Work being done at Bush Gardens in Florida may one day help ensure their survival. The koala from Australia is a very interesting animal from a zoo standpoint because it is not an endangered species, but it is an animal that zoos are working with to attempt to understand more and more about this animal. The koala is being threatened in Australia because of habitat destruction. There are disease processes that are going through the koalas. And the biggest problem is the koala is totally dependent upon the eucalyptus tree, which is being eliminated in some areas. Eucalyptus trees are being clear cut to provide land for agriculture and for housing development. This creates problems for all tree dwelling animals and especially for the finicky koala. And the koala is not an adaptable animal. It eats only eucalyptus leaves, and in zoos and in captivity at this point in time, there has been a lot of research that's been going on to uh, possibly create a man-made diet for our koalas that uh, would allow them not to totally rely upon their native and historic diet. So that's one area that zoos are helping in uh, dealing with a non-endangered species. And zoos are trying to get ahead of the endangered status in many species. With the way the world is and the future for so many animals being very bleak, it's very important for zoos to work with animals before they become at a critical point. Anheuser-Busch theme parks, the pledge made real.